Um, so we're, we're doubly or quadruply lucky today. Um, we have uh, Torben Anderson, the Chief Communications Officer, or oh, Chief Commercial Officer, sorry, uh, from Better Place, Denmark. And if you don't know Better Place, uh, a very interesting case for us because it's got a, a very interesting and also very challenging uh, business model, uh, taking what is essentially good for society and trying to build some or extract some value from it. Um, so when you're ready, Torben, over to you. Right, well, thank you very much. Um, pleasure having the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, I just had the opportunity to see Tommy before, and I think that uh, comparing Better Place and uh, Polio is, um, is probably as far as they can get from each other as, as two startups right now. Um, I'll talk a bit about the Better Place history and where we are coming from, but, but uh, it's certainly a very, very different situation we are in. Um, and I, I hope you will see that. But at the same time, I also see that it also just shows how within a, a span of, of just four, four years as we've been going, and I think it's about the same time they've been going, how far or how different two, two, two startups can actually turn out, depending on where they're coming from and, and what their backgrounds are. Just a few words about myself. Um, I actually came from the IT industry. Uh, I worked for IBM and I worked for Microsoft uh, for, for numerous years, 15 plus years, uh, in, uh, in Denmark, uh, in the UK and in the Baltic region. So I've been traveling a bit around. Um, but regardless of what I've been doing within these big companies, it's always been about starting new things, whether it's been starting a new market or starting a new product or, or, um, or otherwise uh, expanding the, the, uh, the business. And when I got a chance to join Better Place, for me, that was a kind of an opportunity to get out into a new sort of startup business. Uh, I joined about two and a half years ago um, as, as uh, responsible for sales. So far, you can say it's been going really well because we haven't sold anything yet. And uh, I've done that for two and a half years now. Um, but we're just about to launch our network. Uh, and about a year ago, I also took over responsibility for marketing. If we take a look at Better Place, um, it's actually, the whole company started with a question. And uh, our founder, Shai Agassi, was a part of the um, uh, uh, Young, Young Global Leaders Forum at the, the Davos meetings. And uh, at one of these uh, 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 sh sessions like these, the question, the rhetorical question was asked, how can you make the world a better place? And, um, you know, people came with their different points and, and uh, Shai thought a lot about this and actually came up with the, with the idea that the way to make the world a better place is to end our dependency on oil. If we look at how oil influences the world, uh, we also see that it actually has a lot of bad influence on how things are. And, um, and for him, that was, that was one, uh, one way to really make the world a better place. And, um, you know, one thing is to suggest that, but the other thing is to say, well, how do you do it? And, and he actually spent some more time on this rhetorical question and, and uh, came up with the, uh, with the idea that, well, if you really want to end the dependency on oil, you need to take oil out of the transport uh, sector. And um, he, he then said, well, if you want to take oil out of the transport sector, what is it that we do? What do we do if we want to take our cars and lorries and trucks and everything and turn them into something that doesn't run on, 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 uh, on diesel uh, or gasoline? Well, there are different options. You could go hybrid, you can go um, uh, you know, uh, uh, hydrogen, you can go electric. And eventually, Shai you know, looked at different options and said, I, you know, electric seems like the best option. Um, so the idea really became, well, how, how do we transform the transportation sector into something sustainable based on electric? And he, um, Shai at that time was, um, was the uh, chief, uh, of, uh, chief development officer for SAP, so he had a, a great job at a, at a big, big software corporation. He actually sold his own business into SAP and was sitting there and, and, and responsible for all their development. And he was, he was uh, already kind of pre-announced as the next uh, co-CEO of the company. Uh, nevertheless, he still spent some time pitching his ideas, see if there was someone who wanted to, to pick up on it. And one day he was in a meeting where um, Simon Peres, the former Israeli president was. And um, after the, 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 the meeting, Simon Peres came to Shai and said, Shai, you know what? I have a country for you. Why don't you do this in Israel? Um, then we, you know, 
the, the, all you need is a country who wants to do it. Shai says, well, you know, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm my, my career path is already set. I'm uh, supposed to become the new CEO of, of uh, SAP. Um, and, and the story goes that Simon Peres said to him, uh, well, I hope it's a very important thing you're doing if it's more important than your country. Shai is originally from Israel. Um, so he thought a bit about that, and, and eventually he came around and said, well, um, there's an opportunity, maybe I should actually try this startup thing. Um, and so he, he went out and formed Better Place. And eventually, you know, in the beginning, it was a, a few people in an office in Palo Alto, but they actually, um, within a year, they had raised $200 million in capital uh, in, the, in the first round. Uh, the majority of the investment came from a... Um, a large Israeli investor. Uh, you could say it's a, it's, a co it's a company called Israeli Corp, which is a, almost like Maersk in Denmark. They're big in shipping, they're big in oil, um, and, but they, they're never less invested. And then uh, a number of smaller venture capitalists in the US. Um, and the project really started designing uh, you know, the, the, a solution for Israel. Uh, relatively soon after, Denmark uh, became the, the next area. And um, in Denmark, Dong became an investor from the, from, the, from the outskirts of it. So they are a minority investor in the Danish company. Um, and then about two years ago, not that long after Denmark started, uh, another round of capital was raised, $300 million. Um, and about a year ago, no, sorry, late last year, late 2011, another $250 million was raised. In the last round, the investors, uh, sorry, in the second round, the investors included uh, HSBC, the bank, uh, actually investing their own money, M Morgan Stanley also investing in that, uh, in that round, and in the last round, the investors included uh, General Electric, um, among others. So you could say that uh, a, a very, very rapid raise of capital, uh, the, 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 the valuation that the company got was around the same as Vestas uh, had um, in the in just before Christmas, which is a bit higher than it is right now. So about 22 billion, uh, sorry, 22 billion kroner um, valuation. And there's still not a single dollar of revenue um, in the company. So you could say that uh, there's many different paths you can take as a new startup. And, and, and uh, there are many different ways of looking at how you can you know, expand your business or raise your capital. This is probably a very exceptional case, but nevertheless, a case of showing that in a, a span of less than five years, you can actually go from basically an idea on a, on a sheet of paper to an investment made at least of, of 750 million kroner, uh, dollars. Sorry. So what is it that we do? Why, why are we actually uh, uh, gathering all this money? Because uh, there's no reason to just take in all these investments if you're not because you're spending the money. Well, the challenge is that if you look at, at, the, um, at the electric vehicle, uh, it may seem like a very, very easy and compelling case. Uh, you know, just switch. Uh, your fuel, but it's, uh, it's actually uh, quite a lot of challenges. And historically, um, the electric vehicle have been around several times, but it's never really become a success. Some of the challenges has been that, you know, the cars were not really uh, interesting cars. They were usually not uh, made from glass fiber or they were, you know, uh, um, uh, two-seater cars or things like that. So getting the right cars was a very important thing. Better Place have been working very closely with Renault to develop a uh, a series of electric vehicles that is actually similar to um, or better than, than gasoline vehicles. The other part of it has been the cost. It's a huge cost involved generally in electric vehicles because you put a battery in the car, which is quite expensive compared to the rest of the vehicle. Uh, that's made the, the car acquisition cost quite high. Uh, one, of the, one of the ways we're trying to solve that is basically by separating the battery and the car. Say to people, well, go buy a car. It'll cost about the same as your regular car. And then you get all the needs that you have around your, your driving needs, including a battery, actually from better place. Because we're able to pool the batteries and actually make a, a business case out of owning them, we can, we can make uh, it worthwhile for you to buy the vehicle and then just have the battery from us. Then there's the whole challenge of the range. Electric vehicles, you know, a full battery today uh, on a standard kind of car gives you maybe 150 up to 200 kilometers. Uh, I know Tesla has been putting even bigger batteries in some electric vehicles and get up to maybe 400 uh, kilometers, but then the battery becomes very, very expensive. Um, the idea there that, 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 that we have um, uh, pitched to the, to the marketplace basically is, well, 
let's not always just charge the battery. If the battery is empty and you want to continue straight away, let's switch the battery. Let's take the battery out and put in a full battery. So um, we're basically making a solution where we switch the battery the same way you do in, a, in an uh, uh, electric drilling machine or anything like that. Um, another issue has been that usually you, know, you, would, you, would, uh, you would not find anyone who would make a solution out of this. So you would go buy a car somewhere, you would charge, find a way to charge it, and if something didn't work or you wanted to charge somewhere in the public domain, that wouldn't be a pl place to do it. So getting a, so a solution around it, building customer service into it, building a network uh, uh, ahead of the time was really a very important thing to, uh, to make sure people wanted to get into this. And then last but not least, if you really want to do this, if you want to take the 2 million cars in Denmark, or 2.1 million cars in Denmark and turn them all electric, it's putting a huge demand on the grid because that's quite a lot of extra electricity that needs to be distributed. And if you don't manage that in a sensible way, if you just go home at 5 o'clock at night or 6 o'clock at night, if you're not working at a startup and come home at 10, then, you know, and then plug the car into, your, uh, into a socket at home, and then go on into your house and turn on the TV and turn on all the light, turn on the, the oven or the heating or whatever. You know, the, the, the peak in, um, in electricity use is going to go through the roof and it's going to require an enormously expensive update of our uh, network distribution system. So we're working on that to make sure we actually charge in an intelligent way. We charge at the time when there's less uh, requirement on the, on the, on, or less strain on the network. And we, we actually also try to, to match the energy uh, production, for instance, in Denmark from the, the wind turbines with the needs of the cars. So we can actually utilize a lot of, of, um, of uh, renewable energy instead of just burning coal in order to, uh, to, uh, to fill the cars. So those are some of, some of the, the challenges that we're addressing. Um, and, and that's involving building a, a whole new ecosystem around the cars, the, uh, the, uh, electrician, uh, sorry, the electricity distribution companies, um, the, 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 the dealers out there, etc., etc. And the solution that we have is, is basically based around a number of components. If we start up, uh, we'll start in the middle, you can say, obviously the car is a super important thing. That's, that's the thing that people want to buy. Um, the car that Renault has built now that has a replaceable battery or, uh, is, is uh, called the Renault Fluence. It's basically a five-person family sedan, um, you know, and, and drives like any other car out there, except that it may be a little bit faster uh, than, than, a, um, than a similar car, at least it accelerates. You buy that car without the battery, and as part of our solution, we supply a battery to you. That also helps us when we want to switch them, so you don't, you don't come in with your brand new battery and then get a maybe a year-old battery and say, well, you know, I'm not sure I want to leave my new battery here because we own all the batteries and have them in our pool. We provide people with a charge spot so that they get a, a, an intelligent socket at home, a socket that we can, we, we can monitor so that we know that they're being charged, a socket that where we can say, well, let's turn on electricity or turn off electricity so that we charge them at the right time and actually make sure we, uh, we help uh, both balance the grid and uh, utilize the, the sustainable uh, energy out there. We're building a network. Uh, we're building battery switch stations in 20 different locations right now across the, the Danish highway network. Um, so that when you want to do a, a, a trip that's longer than what your, your bas battery capacity actually is, you uh, can drive in and then an unmanned station within five minutes have your depleted battery removed and a new full battery put into the car and you can continue your journey. So it's basically like filling up your car with gasoline except you don't need to step out of the car and you don't need to go and pay 13 kroner and 52 uh, euro per liter of gasoline when you're, when you're, when you're uh, charging your car here or filling up your car. I have to admit you have to do it a little bit more often than we would do in a, in a diesel car that might do five, seven, five six, seven hundred kilometers uh, in, in one right now uh, because you have to do it you know, maybe once every 150 kilometers. But at the same time, the thing is that you actually have this charge spot that it magically fills up your car every night. So when you get up in the morning, the car's full. So it's only when you actually do the long rides, which for the Danish population is, is probably around once a month or once every six weeks. Then we've also built uh, an intelligent piece of software uh, that sits in the car that actually helps you do your route planning. 
So if I want to go from here to Aarhus, it will tell me exactly where I need to go in and switch my batteries. And when I get to Aarhus, it can tell me where it is that I can find a charge spot if I, if I want to charge while I'm parked there. It also helps me um, you know, uh, find charge spots when I'm driving shorter distance, or it's also my GPS, it's my entertainment system, etc., etc. So that's really what the solution is, is about. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we plan to take this, this product to market? What's the, the, the business concept behind it? You could say, well, as you say that Renault has just released the car, so they're actually just for sale now. Our network uh, is unfortunately coming uh, a few months after. Uh, it's taking a bit longer to, uh, to get all this, the sites installed and get the robots and machinery and, and things like that uh, fixed there. So that, that's actually opening um, starting from next month. Um, and what we are doing is basically to go out now and, 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 uh, and build the market. That's what we've been doing for, for some years now. We have been focusing a lot of fleets, uh, partly because they are, uh, you know, you can do a sale to a fleet of where you will not, instead of selling one car at a time to an individual, you can actually sell uh, maybe 10 or 15 or 100 cars if you're fortunate to a, to a bigger fleet. Uh, also because we know that the fleets are, have a, a, a very, um, fixed pattern where they usually replace their cars every three years. So even though it's uh, relatively fewer cars, we, can, we know exactly when they're being replaced. They will go to a leasing company and they will go say, you know, we have five cars now that needs to be replaced. If we do a good job, we can get an electric vehicle in there. Another segment that we've been focusing on with the fleets are the, the, the municipalities here in Denmark. They've been very anxious to show that they wanted to be green in the marketplace. So uh, again, a, a good customer group for us to, to, uh, to work with. And then we, we know that if you want a technology like this to succeed, you need to get the first adopters or early adopters to, to take it on and, and go demonstrate it and show to other people that it's actually a good decision to move on to an electric vehicle. So it's been super important for us to find um, the early adopters, make sure we, 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 uh, we get them on board early on and, and um, they're the ones that has to lead the way for the rest. Uh, some of you may have read the, uh, the inventor's dilemma and read about the, the um, the gap there uh, that, that you're struggling with, uh, crossing the chasm. Um, and, and, you know, for us, it's a super important thing. This is a great idea. Everyone can talk about it as being a great idea, but if they don't see people do it, if they don't see people that they really believe are, you know, trendsetters or, or market leaders doing it, they won't do it themselves. It is a change. It is a challenge to, to do a habit change, and, and we, we, we certainly need that to happen. And then, of course, the general consumers are going to come, but I... You know, I think we'll see a typical adoption curve where we'll take some time before we actually get into the broader set there. How are we going to market? Uh, well, you can say we have, we've done the traditional thing, so we're working with the, with the car dealers today, but we've also done something maybe less traditional, so we build, build our own Better Place Center, which is basically a store where we, we don't sell the car, but we, we've been educating people on the solution, and we're now transforming it into a place where you can actually buy the car and the solution. And it's, it's much different from your, your, your regular car dealer. And it's been very important for us to kind of distance ourselves from that because a lot of people don't feel very comfortable with the, with the car dealer uh, today. And, and, um, and uh, they may also feel that it's difficult to buy this product from someone who's been advocating for a gasoline or diesel car for, for, the, for the last uh, many, many years. Another thing that I think is going to be important here is that we've, we've actually seen a lot of the market move on to the web. Um, in the past years. Uh, if you look at the used car market, it's basically all happening on the web today. Um, and uh, in the US, we're starting to see that new cars are also being sold online. I believe that, that uh, with, a, uh, with, a, with a new product like this, there's actually a, a huge opportunity there. But of course, there's the challenge. Uh, the, uh, the, the current industry is, uh, is reluctant on this and uh, are holding back on, on moving into new markets, obviously. The products that we are, we are offering um, is basically uh, a subscription service. So you, uh, you pay a fixed price um, on a monthly basis to a better place, depending on how many kilometers you want to, 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 uh, to drive. We then provide you with a chart spot. We provide you with all the electricity you need to drive this amount of kilometers. We provide you with the battery. We provide you with access to a network of, of battery switch stations across the country and a network of chart spots that we've installed in the, uh, around in the countryside uh, or in, in cities and other locations. We do that for the cars that have a switchable battery. And right now, that's, that's only the Renault Fluence. 
So come back to that's that's one of our potential challenges. Um, we also do it for for batteries. That, sorry, for cars that cannot switch battery, um, uh, like the Nissan Leaf or the Renault Kangoo or other electric vehicles that are out there. And then last but not least, you know, we offer uh, sorry we, we we offer a service to our existing customers so they can maybe say, well, I, I would like to have a secondary charge spot somewhere because I have a a summer house somewhere where I go and, and, and spend my vacations, it's far away, but you know, when I'm up there, I would like to be able to charge as well because I may spend a month there or something like that. But we're also looking at the you know, roaming customers. We believe that this, this marketplace will develop. There's not just going to be one player. Um, we already seen that there are different competitors in the Danish marketplace. They will put up chart spots. Uh, we will put up chart spots. We need to be able to, like the, uh, the mobile phone companies, to offer customers if they're outside of their home zone, basically, to use other people's infrastructure. If we look at the business and the, the situation or the business case we're in here, compared to someone like Podio, where it's really about developing intellectual capital, and then if you, if you do the right thing and sell it to a sufficient number of people, the production cost for each new customer out there is usually relatively small. Um, obviously, since they're running it as an online uh, service and, or hosted service, they still have maybe to add some more server capacity. Uh, but if you look otherwise at IT companies, as I said, I came from Microsoft, it was just a matter of printing a disk or sometimes even just printing a piece of paper that says, here's a license to a piece to our software, you know, pay now. Uh, the, the situation we have here is, is much more of an upfront investment. Uh, we are an infrastructure company, so you can compare what we're doing to building a bridge and then when you open the bridge, you, you have spent a lot of money building it, and then you, you take a toll every time people cross it, which is basically your, your small revenue, but it's going to come in a steady, steady state over the next many years while you pay back what you, what you paid for the bridge, and, um, and, um, and hopefully get to a break even at some, at some point in time to a, to a profit situation. Um, building infrastructure, and we, we, I mean, we've seen it with the, for instance, with the mobile carriers has been, uh, uh, in some situations, a um, uh, very, very successful business. Uh, but it does require a, a huge upfront investment, and it does require investors that has a long-term perspective on how to do business. Um, we cannot um, pay back the network that we've done in, in the first year, or the maybe second year, third year. It will take some time, because it will require us to build up our member base um, over a period of time. And, and you could say that, that doing uh, an infrastructure investment like this is in itself is a challenge uh, because you have to, as I say, raise a lot of capital up front, get someone to buy into the fact that you actually can build the infrastructure and make money on it afterwards. But for us, it's, uh, there's actually an additional challenge in the fact that every time we get a new customer, we have to go install a chart spot with them and we have to go um, buy a new battery for their cars. So we actually have even a high acquisition cost for a new, for a new customer. Um, again, you can compare it a little bit to the mobile world where at least in the past, there was usually a high subsidy to get a new customer because you paid for their handset basically or gave it away for, for a very, very limited sum. Um, but again, you said, well, that's worthwhile because we get a new subscriber onto our network and we can get the on, uh, recurring revenue afterwards. But again, if you, if you compare it to the other business model, it's a very different one. And, and one of the key things to keep in mind if you want to do infrastructure is really to make sure that the, uh, you could say the hole you're digging, the, the amount of money you spent at, the, um, at starting up or building the network, if that's too deep, then you will never get out of it. Uh, you know, the interest on, on the loans you have to make or the, the, the capital you're investing will just be so high that you know, regardless of how well you do, how many new subscribers you get on, you will never get your money back. Um, you could say that, that with, in, you know, if you look at cars, if you look at that industry there, with, with 2.1 million potential subscribers in Denmark, um, um, it can be quite a hole we can dig, or it can be quite an investment we can make because there's a huge potential. Um, but if you look at other infrastructure projects, you really have to look at a, at a, at a very significant base for you to, to be willing to, to invest into this and, and, um, and uh, take that risk of building up the network or the infrastructure ahead of time. Let me just pause there and see if there's any questions. Um, if not, I have a, a, a few things to point out to maybe show you some of the, the challenges or, or uh, things that we have to do to make this, this uh, really work. But uh, 
let's hear what, what you want to talk about first. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, how do you see the risk of the development of the battery actually uh, kind of pushing you out to the side? Because right. suddenly the range is, is going to go much higher. Right. You know, there's a lot of talk about uh, how fast the development is going to go once it kind of gets you over the edge and starts yeah. growing. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a very good question, it's a very relevant question. The interesting thing is that the, the batteries that are being used in, in cars, electric vehicles today, are basically the same batteries as you find in, in, um, in PCs or mobile phones or so. So I don't think that, that there is a, that's a big invention just around the corner just because electric vehicles comes around. The guys that have been doing batteries for, for all sorts of devices for the last uh, 10, 20 years have invested enormous amount of money in, in uh, research and development to find a better battery. However, what we, what we are seeing is, of course, there are small incremental steps. And, and, and certainly, there's a big step on the, on the cost of the battery. We're expecting 5 to 8% cost reduction year over year, which is a very important thing. But let's even imagine that tomorrow someone came up with a 400-kilometer battery that would be the same size and the same price as the 150-kilometer battery we have today. It doesn't really change our business case that much then maybe you only need to switch your battery once every two months instead of once every month you know, for the average consumer. But the guy who's driving uh, more than 400 kilometers in, in one trip will still need to do that. And if you want your car to be your you know, all-purpose freedom machine, then you, you don't want to be limited even to 400 kilometers. So we actually welcome a, a development of the, of the battery, and, and we see that to, for us that would mean if, if customers have been buying into our product, we would actually be able to offer them a battery with a, with a uh, bigger range. Maybe they only want that battery for certain situations if they were doing a longer trip uh, because it might be more expensive or it might be heavier or something like that. But battery development is helping all of us. It's a super important thing. And, and we, again, I don't think that our infrastructure becomes obsolete because the battery might uh, go further. I think it's useful. Yeah. Uh, it seems like you are developing a new standard. Why have you chosen only to be in Denmark and Israel? Why not uh, other countries? Well, uh, we are starting in Denmark and Israel. The third country that's going to go online is actually Australia. Um, so you could say that we are we're making sure that our networks are not interconnected. Um, if we could choose three, three places in the world that, that you probably don't drive from to, is, we probably found three very good examples there. But um, no, it's, it's been important to find places to start. And as I say, it's a, it's a huge infrastructure investment. So finding the investors in the local market who are willing to, uh, to be part of it is, is certainly a challenge. Um, and I believe that it's going to be very important that we actually prove that what, we have, what we've been talking about is something we can do. And uh, Denmark and Israel are going to be the first proof countries. And then we are we're rolling out in Australia afterwards. Um, I, I should say not by putting battery switch stations everywhere across Australia because the, the rollout, I mean, first of all, the driving pattern is not so that you drive from one end of the other to Australia. Um, it's, it's really a, around the metropolitan areas. Um, but nevertheless, it's, it's, a, it's an example of a much bigger market that we're trying to, to, to prove it in afterwards. Yeah, I would like to ask two questions. First, uh, what will the cost of running the car for the end customer be compared to a regular car? Yeah. And the second, uh, who is going to be servicing these uh, cars? I suppose the re regular Renault dealer might not have the tools needed. Okay. If we start with the latter one, uh, the Renault dealerships are actually, um, Renault has trained their dealers and, and they have appointed 20 of their almost 40 dealers in Denmark to be SETI dealers uh, that sells their zero emission series. Um, so actually they have, they have decided to make the existing channel take care of this as well. A lot of the, a lot of the stuff inside the car is really the same. Um, you could say that the Fluence is, is, uh, is almost a gasoline car, we just replaced it with an with a electrical engine. Um, if you look into the engine compartment, you'll see that a lot of the other things around it is the same. Obviously if you get a, a dent or something like that, paint job, all that is exactly the same. So it's the same dealers. Um, and the first question was, uh, remind me again, sorry? The price? The price, yes. Um, well, the, the price, I can just show you here. Um, if, you, uh, if you want to drive 10,000 kilometers a year, 
the price to better place is, uh, is basically 1,500 kroners a month of 1,499. And then you can see there are different tiers depending on how many kilometers you want to drive. Um, then there is an initial fee or startup fee uh, as part of becoming a customer. Uh, and then you have to buy the car, which is 205,000 Danish kroner. So um, if you do comparison, it's, it's doing a comparison between an electric car and a gasoline car is difficult because um, you, know, you cannot really compare engine size the same way. The booth of the electric vehicle today is smaller because the battery takes off some space there. Um, but you get a much nicer driving experience. You get a, a, an automated gearbox basically because there's only one f gear going forward and, 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 and things like that. So in many ways you get a, a nice driving experience but also maybe with, with a few downsides. So if you compare it to a, a Renault Megane, for instance, the Renault Fluence here, you will see that at, um, you know, if you drive 20,000 20, kilometers, you do that over a four year period and you ex uh, assume that the gasoline prices stay where they are right now then you might save about 5% having an electric car. So it's about the same. If the gasoline prices continues through the roof as they've been doing for the last, um, uh, well, you can almost say forever, but you know, not least in the last couple of years, then um, it will probably be uh, uh, cheaper to own and operate the electric car. The challenge is no one knows how much an electric car is worth three years from now if you want to sell it again. So, Obviously, that doing the math depends a lot on what you, what you, uh, what you, where you set the residual value of the car. I would argue that in three years from now, there are going to be very few used electric vehicles to buy. So if people still want electric vehicles, some of them are going to say, well, I'm willing to pay a premium to get a used electric car. Similar to how you've seen, maybe there are, uh, there were, at some point in time, there are very few um, Mini Coopers used for sale. And hence, they would get a premium because demand was higher than supply. Uh, so I would argue that electric cars are going to be much worth in three years. Other people say, well, yo, I think you have a version 1.0 product here. There will be a version 2.0 and a 3.0 product before this actually gets out into the used car market. And hence, I don't think it's anything worth. So you, know, you can argue for both uh, scenarios. One of the concerns as a consumer could be that uh, all this is very limited for, to one car brand and to one company providing these changing stations. Um, is there any chance that other players could come into the market? Um, because it's a bit risky to, to you know, put your money into just one company. Yeah, I mean, I'm, you're right, it's, it is. Some customers will see this as an issue. Um, there are already today other players that offer charging services. No one else have, have uh, developed the, the battery uh, shifting uh, infrastructure or is doing something similar like that, except in China. In China, we're seeing that uh, they have the. Uh, in China, they generally has this issue that uh, have this issue that there are uh, you know way too many people who want to have cars, and um, as you know, China doesn't have a lot of of. of uh, of uh, oil production, uh, so uh, they're going to be very, very dependent on foreign oil if they want to have all the cars that people actually want there in the next couple of years. So China is looking a lot at uh, electric vehicles, and they've also concluded that that trying to, I mean, another way to to um, to enable electric cars instead of switching the battery is to do fast charging. So trying to use high to high voltage charging to actually charge the cars faster, and and uh, the Chinese have come to the conclusion that that is going to put such a strain on the network because the, the amount of power you want to pull from the network when you're trying to, to fast charge a car is very high. So they have also said that they believe that battery switching is the, is the right solution. So there are players in, in, in China who are showing uh, kind of similar solutions. We are also present in China now and, and trying to uh, work with the, uh, the second largest uh, energy company there, um, uh, China South Grid, to um, to build a network for their users in the southern part of, of, uh, of China. Um, but uh, right now, we're the only one who has this technology. You could say that if, if, if we stopped, appear, you know, stopped being here, you would, you would have a car where you would be able to, to rent a, or lease a battery from, from uh, Renault instead, and then just charge it in a, in a regular charge spot from one of, you know, a competitor or someone else who's doing that today, offering that service. There are other people offering charging services today. 
on changing stations and bring the battery out. I don't see there's anything preventing from it. We don't, we don't own the car. Uh, we may have some patterns on how we're doing it, but you know, uh, I don't think we, we have a pattern for taking a battery out of a car. There's a question up there. Uh, yes. When living in, in the city, it's not always that you, like a, when you have a house, are able to actually place your car at one spot every night. Um, and for most, I would not be uh, that kind to actually place my car one place and then uh, just open it and put it in a cable. I'd be afraid that uh, Friday evening, uh, drunk people that always uh, go around to put it out. Yeah. How do you ensure that uh, the system can actually last? Right. Two things. First of all, if you are um, if you're one of those strong people who try to pull out the cable, uh, it's actually locked, both in the charging station and the car. It's only the, 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 the lid where you have the inlet similar to if you open for the, uh, for, your, for the inlet for the gasoline, that's open. And of course, if you could break that off if you're, if you're really keen, but I guess you can do that on almost any car. And I guess you only, you only try to wee in it once, um, and then you realize that it's not a good idea to, to, to try to hamper it that way. Um, no, it's, it's safe. But um, the, the, um, the, the real challenge here is that we talk about, if we talk about the people who live in the city that don't have their own uh, parking lot, how do we actually service them? And it's been, a, it's been a huge thing, and, and you know, you, I'll tell you the number of hours being spent on trying to solve that one has been, it's been big. We, we've come to a very pragmatic solution. Uh, what we're doing right now is in the major cities, uh, we are working with the municipalities to basically be allowed to put up chart spots in different locations. So for instance, in Copenhagen, we are just, we just uh, deployed, or in the process of deploying 20 different sites, uh, Østerbro, uh, Vesterbro, Nørrebro, and the central of Copenhagen, where we can tell people that well, there is a chart spot, and there's a, uh, a parking lot that's reserved for an electric vehicle. And um, when well, you know what subscribers we have in the area, so you know, we cannot promise you that there won't be another car there. It could be someone else who, uh, who is uh, having an EV party and has invited all his friends with EVs, and then they might be, be blocking those parking lots because you, won't, you cannot get a, uh, you know, uh, your own license plate for that particular parking lot. The municipality won't allow that. The only thing they do that for is for um, um, disabled drivers. Um, so, but we can promise you with a very high certainty that you actually have a, a certain place to park. Then it may be 100 or 200 meters away from where you live, but if you, if you live in the center of Copenhagen and you have a car, you probably already know today that if you get home late or just a little bit later than everyone else, then you have to circle around for quite a while to find a place, and it's oftentimes far away from where you live anyway. Now you know where to drive to, and you have a parking lot there, you have a charging, a charging uh, possibility there. So I think it's, it's not an ideal solution, you could say, but it's certainly a, a very pragmatical and, and possible solution for, for many people. And it should be safe as well to leave it charging there. You pointed out this, this thing that it's, <laughs> it's why that you can charge it during the night uh, and use the power from the wind belts. Why haven't you... Um, Enter the or try to enter the Icelandic or Swedish market, whereas there is a lot of this uh, hydro energy and geothermal energy. Well, um, Sweden and Iceland actually Renault doesn't sell the car in Sweden because uh, the the temperatures are so low there and battery performance in very very cold weather is uh, is degraded. So they have decided not to take the car to uh, to Norway and Sweden to start with. Um, the other thing is that if you look at the renewables they have in, in Sweden, Norway, and also to a certain, well, I think to a large extent in Iceland as well, um, they are actually manageable renewables. You know, you can turn the turbine on and off in the, um, in the uh, hydropower. Um, so we, we cannot decide when the wind is blowing. So the, 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 the fluctuations in the energy production in Denmark, because of the high uh, percentage of, of uh, wind turbines is actually much higher than what we have in, in Sweden and Norway, for instance. Usually what we, what we actually do is that, or we, what we used to do is that we would export uh, surplus wind energy from Denmark to Norway and Sweden when we had that surplus and then would then either stop the wind turbines, or I believe the Norwegians even have systems places where they, they would pump water uphill so that they would have more water to, to feed downwards later in order to you know, utilize that energy. As you know, the, you have to have balance in the grid all the time. 
Um, so Denmark is, is, is special there. Um, but even if you, you know, if you go to France, for instance, where they have a, a lot of nuclear power, you could also say that electric, uh, or electric cars makes, makes sense there from, a, from the perspective of you know, not doing any local pollution and, and um, from you know, taking you away from the dependency on oil. Um, and, and just also from the, the pure aspect of the car not, you know, not making the same amount of noise uh, when it's driving, etc., etc. So there's value in it, I would say, almost in any market. But obviously in Denmark, there was a, a specific case to prove because it, it can, it can uh, potentially show how wind energy can be more easily phased into an energy production system or electricity production system uh, by using electric cars as a... Um, as a, as a lever, so to speak, to manage the, or balance the network. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I did. Okay. There's another one in the back. Yeah. Um, when you are, you wrote that uh, it's for private and uh, personal users, but for private users, wouldn't it be uh, quite, uh, how much more time do you have to use on a tank? A regular car drives around 1,000 kilometers on a tank, and this one is 150, so that you have to change uh, six times more than. No, you have to remember that you actually get you have a full tank every morning here. So that's one tank. So yeah, but, but 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 nevertheless, you know, if you if you look at it, the average Dane will only usually once or you know on average once a month drive more than 150 kilometers. So I I you know I've been driving an electric car for six months. None of the battery switch stations are open yet. And of course there's been, I couldn't drive to visit my aunt in, in Aarhus. But you know, with my driving pattern to the office back and forward, I've never been to a tank. I just plug in at home. And then I always have a full tank when I get to my, back to my car. So from that point of view, I don't need to go to the gasoline station. And I think that for most people, you know, if you, if you drive, uh, on average, a Dane drives 18,000 kilometers a year. And if you spread that out over 365 days, you will see it's not very often that you do more than 150 kilometers. So if you then do 10 of those trips in a year, and you then have to, and those trips have to go into a switch station twice, it's 20 times. And if you, I'll tell you, it's a good car if it does 1,000 kilometers in a full tank today, but nevertheless, you know, if we just do it, you will have to go in there 18 times to, to fill it up if it's 18,000 kilometers. So it's, it's about the same. I, and, and by the way, I think that's a smaller, it's a smaller issue for the consumers. The, the, I don't think that's really where the consumer gets concerned. Yeah. But for the private sector, I was, uh, I was actually aiming for the private sector that you said that there were some of those for all the leasing cars that you were oh, yeah, aiming right, for. Right. And as my girlfriend had a leasing car driving at least 90,000 kilometers a year, she drives a lot. And she wouldn't be able to have one of these because she would use all the time on these shifting stations. Right. That was actually why I asked this question. Right. Okay. Have have but 90,000, 90, I think, is a, is a, is a, is a that must be a quite extreme example. Um, if you look at the uh, at the leasing companies, their average is twenty seven thousand kilometers a year, I believe. So again, if you do the math there. Uh, they, you know, of course, there are some of them that are driving to Jutland and back every day, but but it's not it's not the average. Um, I mean, it's actually here at DTU. There's been uh, there's a there's a big study done uh, on uh, on the Danes' transportation habits, and we've we've taken all that data and modeled it, and that's actually also why we or where we figured out where the battery switch stations should be because these would be the locations where people would actually. Uh, need to switch their batteries, etc. So it's based on on, on the true uh, driving patterns of I think it's is it twenty thousand, thirty thousand people that are being surveyed uh, in this study that's being done. So uh, quite a quite a lot of actual driving patterns. What is your options if you want to go to Sweden for let's say play golf uh, a couple of kilometers, kilometers up? Well, I mean, if 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 you um, you can say you can go half, half of your battery range um, into Sweden and then go back again, right? You don't get that, uh, that far 
to swing it no. before you need to turn around. And, 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 and honestly, if that's what you, like, what you need to do, I mean, the, the way we've done it is that we, have, uh, we, are, we, have, we are working with uh, Avis and Hertz, and they're offering our customers a special price if they want to rent uh, a diesel car, if they want to you know, drive to Lake Garda, or they want to go to, uh, to Sweden to ski, or something like that. Uh, and then you know, you are, you're doing the good thing for the, for the environment and for yourself, hopefully, for 50, months, uh, sorry, 50 weeks a year, and then for two weeks a year, you do something else. <laughs> That's really the best solution we have. Can I uh, jump in with the last question? OK. Um, one of the things we've been teaching in this course is uh, the importance of having a partial rollout. Now, this, I think everybody wants this to succeed, and there's massive value at the end of the tunnel. Um, and the real struggle is for you guys, I guess, is not being able to partially roll out. You need the complete bridge before you can charge people the toll money. Um, just wondering, did you consider looking at these city cars? For example, in Paris now, they're looking at electric city cars and trying to partial roll out there and then expanding on from yeah. that type of platform. Um, it, was, um, it was reviewed as, as one of the, the options to start with. But we basically said that we don't believe that, this, that the market is going to be interesting enough to go into if we don't uh, if we don't actually try to address the segments you know the the the, the first car in the household um, if we if we only do big metropolitan areas uh, we don't believe that it's 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 sufficient an idea to really make it what we want it to be um, so we certainly considered it and and what you can say is that if we look at the instead of looking at the whole Denmark as the rollout if we look at the world as the rollout you can say we only we only rolling out very very small parts in Denmark and Iceland, uh, sorry, Israel to start with, and then the rest of the world is going to come afterwards. Okay. Thank you very much for a, a really interesting Thank you. presentation. Um, and also, I'd like to say I was asked, um, listen, if I cut the presentation short and ask questions of the audience, will they respond? And it's quite a, quite a joke, really. You're, you're so good at asking questions. Uh, so uh, thank you for all being enthusiastic today as well to all of you. Very good, very good.